Electromagnetic induction is at the heart of modern technology. Why? Because it is the physical phenomenon that enables the conversion from mechanical energy to electrical energy and vice versa. Think power plants, electric motors, transformers, chargers. The list of applications goes on and on. So, if you study physics or engineering, you need to understand electromagnetic induction and the physical law at its core, Faraday's law. Come on, let's explore this together. For some, the term electromagnetic induction might sound a bit mystical, but it is actually quite precise. The word electromagnetic refers to electric and magnetic fields. The word induction comes from the Latin verb inducere, which can mean to cause something to happen. Electromagnetic induction means that the motion of a conductor in a magnetic field causes a voltage to appear, and potentially a current. This phenomenon is governed by Faraday's law. But I'm not just going to throw that law at you and ask you to memorize it. Mm -mm. We are going to derive it step by step using only high school math so that you can truly understand it. To make the most of this video, you should be familiar with the concepts of electric fields, magnetic fields, field flux, and conventional current. Check the description for a link to the relevant videos if you need a refresher. We also need the basic rules relating moving charges and electric currents with magnetic fields. I discussed this in this video. Here is a relevant extract. An electric current flowing in a cable generates a magnetic field around it. The direction of the magnetic field lines around the cable is found by applying the right hand corkscrew rule. The thumb represents the direction of the conventional current, and the fingers curling around the thumb represents the field lines of the magnetic field. In our example, at the level of charge little q, the magnetic field is going away from you, that is, into the page. So we have positive charge little q going downwards and the magnetic field created by the current in the cable at the level of little q going into the page. Now, to find out what is the effect of that magnetic field on charge little q, we can use another hand rule. There are various hand rules designed for that purpose and they are all equivalent. The one I use personally is with my right hand flattened out. The fingers represent the direction of the velocity of the moving charge. From the palm comes out the magnetic field. The thumb gives the direction of the magnetic force experienced by the moving charge. If the charge is negative, I just flip the result. By applying the rule to our example, the positive test charge moving downwards feels a force to the right, away from the cable. To calculate the magnitude of that force, you must multiply the charge by the cross product of the velocity vector with the magnetic field strength vector. Here, V and B are perpendicular. So the magnitude of the force is just Q multiplied by the product of the magnitudes of V and B. Great! Now that we have reviewed both hand rules, let's dive in and derive Faraday's law. Consider a uniform magnetic field pointing towards the page. Uniform means that the strength and direction of the field are the same at any point in space. Now, in that field, place a metallic bar of length L that is moving to the right at a constant velocity V. Because the bar is metallic, it's a conductor. That means that electrons in the bar can move around freely. But in this video, we will be using the conventional current model. In that model, Positive charges move and negative charges, which are carried by atoms forming the structure of the bar, stay put. If you want to know why the conventional current model is often used and why it is okay to do so, please check this video. While the bar is moving to the right, the charges inside the bar also move to the right. Apply the right hand rule to the charges. 
the magnetic field causes a force of magnitude QVB upwards on positive charges. The result? The top of the bar accumulates an excess of positive charges, so gets positively charged. While the bottom of the bar gets a default of positive charges, so gets negatively charged. So now, in the bar, we have an electric field E that appears and that is directed downwards. And because of this, the positive charges experience another force, of electrical nature this time, F equals QE, that is directed downwards. The larger the magnetic force, the larger the induced electric field. So after a short transitory period, both forces balance out. We can write that the magnetic force is equal to the electric force, so QVB equals QE. And when you do that, you see that the charge cancels. The result is E equals PV. Have you seen my previous video about the link between electric field strength and electric potential? Recall the main result. The voltage between two points can be derived by line summing the electric field strength from bottom to top. In the bar, because both electric and magnetic forces have balanced out, a static amount of charge can be considered to have accumulated at the extremities of the bar. We now have a situation which is analogue to two charged parallel plates separated by a distance L, where the electric field strength between the plates is uniform. So we can easily solve the integral by first factorizing out E from the sum. And because E equals BV, we get epsilon, the induced EMF, equal to minus BVL. This is our first result. When a bar of length L moves in a magnetic field of strength B at a constant velocity V, with B, V and L perpendicular to each other, an EMF of magnitude BVL is induced between the extremities of the bar. Let's imagine the same bar sliding to the right on two metallic rails without any mechanical friction. And let's keep the same uniform magnetic field B pointing towards the page. The extremities of the rails on the left are connected with a resistance R. So we have now a looped circuit. The magnetic flux passing through that loop is phi, the product of B and A, where A is the area of the looped circuit. If you need a reminder about what is a flux, please check this video. The area is the length of the bar L multiplied by the width of the circuit X. So we can now write the flux phi as the product of B, L and X. As the bar is moving towards the right, X increases with time. And thus, so will the area and the magnetic flux. Since B and L are constant over time, the rate of change of the magnetic flux can be written B multiplied by L multiplied by dx over dt. The rate of change of position, dx over dt, well, that's a definition of velocity. <laughs> so we can write that the rate of change of flux is the product of B, L, and V. This is our second key result. With B, V, and L perpendicular to each other, the rate of change of flux is the product of the magnitudes of these three vectors, B, L, V. Recall our first result. Epsilon, the induced EMF, is equal to minus BVL. Now when you combine both results, you get the induced EMF Epsilon proportional to the rate of change of flux. This relationship is called Faraday's law and is the heart of electromagnetic induction. The magnitude of an induced EMF is directly proportional to the rate of change in magnetic flux. But we still have something important to discuss here. The minus sign. That's where Lenz's law comes in. In 1834, Heinrich Friedrich Emil Lenz, an Estonian physicist, formulated a qualitative rule related to the direction of the induced current before the more quantitative Faraday's law was formalized. That is why both laws are often taught separately at school. But actually, Lenz's law naturally shows up in Faraday's formulation via this negative sign. Lenz's law states that the direction of the induced EMF 
is such that it opposes the change of flux that causes it. In the next video, we will explore why this opposition occurs and how it naturally arises from the principle of conservation of energy. Smash that notification bell so that you don't miss it. Et voilà! If you enjoyed the video or found it useful, please like, subscribe and comment. It really encourages me to work on new videos. In the meantime, take good care of yourself and I'll see you soon for the next episode of Physics Made Easy. Ciao!